Um, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is um, Dr. Taya Johnson. I am, like Laura said, one of the child and adolescent psychiatrists here at UT um, Health Science Center at Tyler. Um, this is uh, one of um, my clinical pearls for primary care presentations. Um, we've done this one several different times, so some of you have, may have heard this one already, um, but we feel that the topic of ADHD in children and adolescents is a very important topic for primary care that a lot of primary care providers do not feel confident um, in treating. And so we feel like, you know, doing this several different times throughout the year is helpful just because, you know, schedules are busy and some people may miss the um, presentation when it happens. So if you've already heard this one, it's, it's the same exact presentation before, but maybe you can hear or learn something different um, this time around. Um, so with that being said, we'll get started. Um, so the goals and objectives, at the end of this, um, you all should have increased information to identify signs and symptoms required to appropriately diagnose ADHD in children and adolescents. Um, We'll provide some examples of how to screen and assess for ADHD in children and adolescents, and then describe some different treatment options to consider when treating children and adolescents with ADHD. So as far as ADHD goes, um, as of 2016, 8.4% of US children ages 2 to 17 were diagnosed with ADHD. Of those children diagnosed with ADHD, 62% were taking medications and 46.7% received behavioral treatment in the previous year. About a fourth of children diagnosed with ADHD did not receive any treatment in 2016. So when we're talking about um, the clinical presentation of ADHD, we are looking for a persistent pattern of inattention and or hyperactivity and impulsivity that interferes with functioning and development and or development as evidenced by inattention and or impulsivity. So first we'll talk about the inattentive um, symptoms. Um, and with to diagnose the inattentive portion of ADHD, you need to have six or more of the following symptoms. Now, that is um, if younger than 17, but for 17 or older, you only need five symptoms for at least six months. And the symptoms must be inconsistent with the developmental level and it must negatively impact the patient in uh, the social settings and in academic or occupational settings. So what are the symptoms of inattention? Again, if they're younger than 17, they're going to need six, of, six or more of these. If they're older than 17, they only need five of these, but it needs to be consistent over at least six months. So um, failing to give close attention to details or making careless mistakes, Difficulty sustaining attention in task or play activities. Often does not seem to listen when spoken to directly, even in the absence of obvious distraction. Does not follow through on instructions and fails to finish schoolwork, chores, or duties in the workplace. They may start tasks but lose focus and get easily sidetracked. Difficulty organizing tasks and activity activities. They avoid, dislike, or are reluctant to engage in tasks that require sustained mental effort. They lose things necessary for tasks or activities. They are easily distracted by extraneous stimuli, and that may include unrelated thoughts in their mind. And then they are forgetful in their daily activities. Now, when it comes to hyperactivity and impulsivity, so the hyperactive component of ADHD, um, again, one will need six or more of the following symptoms for at least six months if they are 17 and younger, but 17 or older, you only need five of the symptoms. And again, these symptoms have to be present for at least six months and they need to be inconsistent with the developmental level and negatively impact the patient on social and academic or occupational activities. These symptoms include often fidgeting with or tapping the hands and, and or feet or squirming in their seat, 
often leaving the seat in situations when remaining seated is expected, running about or climbing in situations where it is inappropriate, and adolescents or adults, they probably won't run around and climb, but they may say that they feel restless a lot and that they just can't keep still and they feel like they need to move. Um, they are unable to play or engage in leisure activities quietly. They are often described as on the go or, act, or acting as if they are driven by a motor. They may have excessive talking. They may blurt out answers before a question has been completed in class or in other situations. They may have difficulty waiting their turn. And then they may often interrupt or intrude on others when others are speaking. So again, you need six or more of these for at least six months. If younger than 17, older than 17, you only need five. Now, when we come to talking about um, ADHD, we need to understand other considerations. Um, these symptoms that the kid is having are not solely the manifestation when they're having these behaviors. They cannot solely be the manifestation of oppositional behavior, defiance, hostility, or failure to understand tasks or instructions. So what that means is if there's a kid who just doesn't do something just for the sake of not doing it, that doesn't mean that that meets criteria for that um, the inattention of where it said that they don't, they avoid or dislike doing things that are um, more mentally taxing. Um, they could just be, you know, the kid could just be oppositional and defiant in that moment. Um, and then also failure to understand tasks or instructions. I have to explain this to parents to a lot because they'll say, you know, that they give their kid um, their chores to do and say it's like a five-year-old. And they say, well, I'll tell him to do, uh, you know, make his bed, brush his teeth, and then um, uh, sit on the couch until it's time to leave for school. And he can't do it. Well, a five-year-old is developmentally not going to be able to handle multi-step instructions for um, for doing things. So I have to explain to parents, that doesn't mean that they have ADHD. Let's first talk about giving one chore at a time or one task at a time, letting them get that done and then moving to the next one. Because at, at five, it's kind of hard to keep track of all of those different tasks that they've been asked to do. So again, that doesn't mean just because they can't handle it that that's a a ADHD symptom, that's a situ situation of they're not understanding or they can't comprehend developmentally the different tasks and instructions that they've been given. Another thing that we need to consider is that um, usually there are several inattentive or hyperactive impulsive symptoms that were present prior to 12 years old. So if you have someone who's coming to you and they've never had any symptoms of ADHD prior to 12 years old, you might want to, you know, put up a red flag that maybe this is not ADHD because usually there are several symptoms of either the inattentive or hyperactive uh, impulsive symptoms that are present prior to 12 years old. Now, granted, they may not have gotten diagnosed with ADHD before 12 years old, but they should be able to tell you that they do recall some symptoms being present. Um, it also needs to, um, we also need to make sure that the, um, that there's clear evidence that these symptoms are interfering with functioning on a social, academic, and occupational level, and that there are, um, symptoms present in two or more settings. So it doesn't work if a parent is complaining, saying the kid doesn't pay attention, doesn't focus at home, but then at school, the teachers are like, no, we don't see any of these problems out of the kid. They get their work done or whatever. If they're not, if there's not symptoms present in two or more settings, then we need to look into something else because ADHD is not going to turn on at home and turn off when it gets to school or vice versa. Um, and then we also um, know that ADHD, the symptoms cannot be explained by another mental health disorder, which I'll go into that in a little bit. So as far as cl clinical pearls, um, one thing is symptoms being, if symptoms are only in one setting, so like I was just saying, only at home or only at school, we need to consider other causes of the patient's symptoms, which are usually psychosocial or environmental. Um, for example, if a kid only has symptoms of ADHD at home, then maybe the parenting style is what 
ca causes those problems or if there's only um, symptoms at school, maybe the teacher's classroom management skills aren't great and that's why the child is having only problems at school. So we need to look for other reasons for why the symptoms are in only one setting compared to um, compared to more than two or more uh, settings. Now, when diagnosing ADHD, we need to specify whether it's a combined presentation, which all that means is that the, the patient meets criteria for both inattention, so that means they have six or more um, symptoms of inattention and six or more symptoms of hyperactivity and impulsivity. That would be a combined presentation. A predominantly inattentive presentation means that they, the patient meets criteria for inattention, so six or more symptoms, but not for hyperactivity impulsivity. So they may have no symptoms of hyperactivity impulsivity. They may have three out of six, but not six. And then there's predominantly hyperactive or impulsive type, which again would mean that the patient meets criteria for hyperactivity and impulsivity, so six or more symptoms under those, but not meeting the criteria for inattention. Um, to confirm the presence of symptoms in multiple settings, you need to consult with informants who have seen the patient in those other settings. So what that means is if you need to see a what the kid looks like at school, you need to talk to a teacher. Or if you got if you need to get some data about what the kid is doing at um, football practice, you need to speak to the coach. And, you know, of course, then at home, you get the information from the parents, but you need to get information from multiple people in multiple settings to be able to confirm the presence of symptoms in multiple settings. Now, there are several uh, associated features with ADHD, which may include low frustration tolerance, irritability, or mood lability. So when these symptoms are present, this could be due to ADHD alone, or it could be due to a occurring mental condition, such as depression, anxiety, or PTSD. And so you got to ask questions to kind of tease out what is the cause of the low frustration tolerance, irritability, or mood lability, because it could be just the manifestation of their ADHD, or it could be something else in addition to ADHD. And of course, we need to know that because in order to tr adequately treat whatever is causing um, those symptoms, we need to make sure we are adequate, adequately treating the right thing. So if we try treating ADHD and those symptoms don't improve, then maybe it's due to a co-occurring mental condition in addition to ADHD. Now, when it comes to differential diagnosis, the, the clinical pearl here is very, very important um, because when someone presents with the chief complaint of poor attention and con concentration, most providers automatically think, oh, this patient has ADHD, and that's just not true. When someone comes in with a chief complaint of poor attention and concentration, you have to evaluate for other psychiatric conditions because ADHD is not the only psychiatric condition which affects attention and concentration. So you need to rule out major depressive disorder because one of the major symptoms of depression is poor attention and concentration. You need to, um, sometimes it's difficult to distinguish between ADHD and depression. Um, versus just both of them combined be, due to the symptoms of irritability being common in children and adolescents with both diagnoses. But that's why you have to ask questions and get more data and give more information to try to distinguish between ADHD versus depression versus the combination of ADHD and depression. Anxiety disorders can also present with symptoms of poor attention and concentration due to anxious thoughts. So if someone has generalized anxiety disorder, they worry about many different things, which affects their ability to concentrate on one task. Someone may have obsessive compulsive disorder, which the, the obsessions can interfere with the patient's ability to concentrate, especially if they are not able to do the compulsions needed to lessen those obsessions. So we have to consider that when someone has a chief complaint of poor attention and concentration. Also, trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder 
um, can affect attention and concentration as well. Intrusive memories and thoughts can impair a patient's ability to concentrate. And then PTSD can also present with symptoms of irritability and other mood symptoms, which can make it difficult to determine is this ADHD or is this PTSD. With psychotic disorders, symptoms of poor focus and attention can be prominent when patients are experiencing hallucinations or disorganized thinking associated with psychotic disorders. And then with learning disorders, children with undiagnosed learning disorders may have symptoms of poor attention and concentration due to not understanding the school subject being taught. They may also be oppositional or disruptive um, to the class so that they can hide the fact that they are not comprehending the material. And so they can look like a, a quote unquote ADHD kid, but they don't actually meet criteria for ADHD because they have a learning disorder. So you have to ask questions and get more information. I, I like to show this slide just because um, I show this to my patients and parents um, when we talk about the different ways that anxiety can present itself. And I put the green um, circle around struggling to pay attention and focus because that is a major symptom of anxiety that I think a lot of people forget about. And that um, sometimes, you know, like I said, people just automatically assume, oh, tr trouble with um, attention and concentration, it's got to be ADHD. And there's just so many other things that can cause that. So just to reiterate, when someone comes with that chief complaint, please do your due diligence to make sure it's not something else before you just automatically say it's ADHD. So now let's talk about the screening and assessment of ADHD in children and adolescents. So screening is recommended according to the um, American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. Screening is recommended during the first mental health assessment visit. So if someone comes in for whatever mental health reason, whether it's anxiety, whether it's depression, whether it's whatever the, the you know, behavioral problems, whatever they're coming to you for, if, they're, if the initial complaint is something that's related to mental health, you should ask questions regarding inattention, hyperactivity, and impulsivity, regardless of the chief complaint. Um, because you want to make sure that you're not missing the uh, diagnosis of ADHD. Um, and then you also should ask if the symptoms are causing impairment in the, in the patient. Now, you also can utilize um, validated screening tools to help ascertain if symptoms are within the clinical range. Um, and so there's a few, I've got, I got a few um, screening tools that I have on here that this list is not exhaustive, but these are the common ones that are used. The the um, Connors rating scale, the Vanderbilt assessment scale, and then the ADHD rating scale four. These tools have both parent and teacher forms to help assess for symptoms in multiple settings. Now, the main thing with the clinical pearl here is that these screening tools are for screening. They are not diagnostic. So when you get someone to come back to you with these screening tools, so let's use Vanderbilt for, um, because I'm, I, I believe most primary care providers are very um, comfortable with using the Vanderbilt. When you get the Vanderbilt, getting the Vanderbilt scales back from teacher and parent, you score it and then you see what the score says. And, you know, it says it might be positive for, you know, ADHD, combined type or whatever, you know, based on um, the responses on the Vanderbilt. The thing is, though, just because it there the results of that screening tool are positive for ADHD or whatever, you should utilize that screening tool to help you question and further assess the symptoms that are um, positive on that screening tool. So if there's someone that, you know, circles three all the way down, you want to make sure that it's an accurate assessment that um, that the parent circled those numbers all the way down because they could just be circling and not paying attention and not reading. And so you need to ask questions. Okay, so on here you said that this happens nearly every day. Can you give me an example of what they do when they are, you know, um, having trouble focusing and paying attention and getting tasks done at home and see if they can give actual examples to help you say, you know, further clarify and further evaluate what is going on. Um, also, the, the screening tools are not good at 
they're not good at not um, of looking into other causes of symptoms of ADHD. Like I was talking about before, ma many different mental health disorders cause symptoms that are very similar to ADHD. So you still need to do a thorough evaluation to make sure it's not one of those other things causing the symptoms and allowing for the screening tool to test to to be positive based on the responses versus just saying, oh, well, this screening tool is positive. So that means this kid has ADHD. That's not how you're supposed to use those tools. Now, to evaluate for ADHD, um, you need to perform a detailed interview with the patient and the parent. Um, ask the parent about each of the 18 symptoms and then assess for the age of onset of those symptoms. You also should obtain information about the patient's school day or daycare functioning. You should evaluate for comorbid psychiatric conditions, and then you should also review the patient's medical, social, and family histories because ADHD is highly heritable and ADHD is likely found in parents and or siblings. You also should obtain information regarding developmental history because many developmental disorders are associated with attention issue hyperactivity. Now, a lot of people ask us questions about psychological or neuropsychological testing. To, di to diagnose ADHD, you do not have to have psychological or neuropsychological testing. Um, ADHD is a clinical diagnosis, meaning that if the patient meets the criteria, they have the disorder. You do not have to verify that they have the disorder with any psychological or neuropsychological testing, which is a good thing because there's a lot of um, there's not a lot of availability of getting those tests done. And so to hold off on diagnosing someone with a condition that they should be getting treated for as soon as possible, when we pretty much have clear data that they meet the criteria, is to di doing a disservice to our patients. And we don't want to delay care when we don't have to. Now, you may need to consider ordering psychological or neuropsychological psychological testing if there is some low cognitive ability going on so you have concerns about an intellectual disability or if the patient has low achievement in math or reading related um, to their intellectual ability so do they have a learning disorder that will not be able to be caught if you don't get that neuropsychological or psychological testing. So that's the only time that you really need it is if you are worried about low cognitive ability or intellectual disability and if you're learning, worried about a learning disorder. Now, as far as treatment, um, we're going to talk about the different, different treatment options for ADHD. So a comprehensive treatment plan for a child or uh, any patient with ADHD should include giving the patient and parents psychoeducation about ADHD and their treatment options, both medication and non-pharmacological um, options. Um, the research has shown that pharmacological interventions is more beneficial than behavioral treatment alone. However, behavioral treatment can be the, the initial treatment in the following circumstances. So if someone has mild ADHD symptoms with minimal impairment, you can try behavioral interventions. If there's an uncertainty of diagnosing the patient with ADHD, you may hold off and just try behavioral treatments first. And then if the parents are um, if the parents are rejecting medications altogether, then, you know, basically you have no other choice but to utilize behavioral treatment. And then if there is a marked disagreement about the diagnosis between parents or between parents and teachers, then you might want to consider behavioral treatment first as well. Now, you should um, help the parents um, find community supports that may be available, such as parent management training to help the parents better manage their patient, the, the patient's symptoms, their child's symptoms. And then you might need to utilize additional school resources, which includes an individual education plan, IEP, a 504 plan, maybe getting additional time on tests or assignments. Now, one thing um, that is non-pharmacologic that people have asked about 
for treatment of ADHD is uh, neurofeedback. And the research shows that neurofeedback is not helpful for ADHD. So there's no need to tell patients to, to go that route or to spend that money to do that. It's not beneficial. And then um, no specific food med modality has been shown to improve ADHD symptoms either. So, you know, avoiding sugar completely or doing omega-3s or whatever else people come up with, it, the research just isn't there um, to show that it improves the symptoms of ADHD. So they can do it if they want to, but that doesn't mean they're going to see benefit from it. So now on to the pharmacological treatment of ADHD. So when we want to, um, to do that, when symptoms are present in multiple settings, that the impairment is moderate to severe, that behavioral inter interventions have been inadequate and or the risk of treatment outweighs the risk of non-treatment. So first we'll talk about the stimulants. The stimulants are highly efficacious in the treatment of ADHD, and they provide the most robust response in treating ADHD. Stimulants are first line in ADHD treatment, especially if no comorbidity. So I know a lot of times parents, when you do a first diagnosis, they say they don't want to use stimulants, but I always explain to them that the research and the data shows ADHD is best treated with stimulants. They are the first line treatment, but as you, that's still sometimes not enough to convince parents, but I at least try. There are two classes of the stimulants. There's the methylphenidate stimulant, the methylphenidate class of stimulants, which includes medications such as, and I'm using trade names. Uh, yeah, I'm using trade names: um, Ritalin, Concerta, Focalin. That's the; those are included in the methylphenidate class. Um, the amphetamine class includes um, Adderall, Vyvanse. Those are the most common that people know out of that class. Now, either class, the, the two classes, I always explain to parents, you literally can just pick one and, and go from there, but we'll go a little bit more into that in just a second. Both classes have, of stimulants have the same side effects. Poss the possible side effects, appetite loss and growth delay, which is the major side effect and is typically dose dependent, um, headaches, stomach aches and nausea, mood lability and or irritability, rebound hyperactivity, and then sleep difficulties. Those are some common um, side effects of the stimulant medications that we have to make sure the parents and patients are aware of. Now, when it comes to clinical pearls regarding this, when you are trying to, um, when you're trying to choose between the two classes of the stimulants, both of the classes are equally efficacious for treating ADHD. 70% of patients are going to respond to whatever class you attempted first, and then 90% is going to respond to either class either of the two classes. So either way it goes, 90% of people are going to respond to some form of the treatment of ADHD. Now, the odds of responding to the same class if there was no response is low, so you should consider switching to the other class of the stimulant. At present, there is no method to predict which stimulant will produce the best response in a given patient. Pharmacogenetic testing is not helpful for stimulant medications since they have little to no metabolism in the liver, which is what pharmacogenetic testing does assess. Now, I know that uh, it used uh, a couple years ago, the FDA made it to where those pharmacogenetic testing had to remove their ADHD panels because of this fact. I don't know if some of them still consider it on there, but I know GeneSight was one of the ones that got rid of it because the FDA said, you know, this is not um, this is not accurate information. So we need to take this. You all can't continue to use this um, for you all's um, panels of medicine and whatever GeneSight does. Um, the amphetamine based class has some liver metabolism. So you might get some data on a genetic test, pharmacogenetic test um, regarding amphetamines, but the methylphenidates are not metabolized in the liver, so it doesn't it doesn't apply to methamphetamine methylphenidate at all. Now per milligram, 
Amphetamine stimulants are twice as powerful as the methylphenidate stimulants. So this information is uh, important because in younger children, so less than 10 years old, starting with a methylphenidate may cause the patient to experience less severe appetite loss. And so that's usually what I do is if there's a child that's younger than 10, I typically start with the methylphenidate stimulant first. Um, older than 10, it doesn't matter. You pick whichever one. But younger than 10, because of the fact that the amphetamine stimulants are twice as powerful as the methylphenidate stimulants, I start, um, I start with methylphenidates in younger kids. In general, you should start you can start with an extended release stimulant since that's easier dosing once a day dosing but however there might be times where there may re require an afternoon booster dose of the immediate release stimulant in the same class you don't have to start treatment with the immediate release and then switch to an extended release if you do not want to now the immediate release stimulants require twice a day to three times a day dosing to control ADHD symptoms. So that may not be beneficial in some cases, but there are some patients who may be more sensitive to medications that you may want to start with the immediate release to determine that dose that works for them and then switch to an extended release stimulant. Now, I often use the immediate release stimulant um, when I'm doing initial treatment in small children, so when if I'm treating a three-year-old, which is not that common, but there's been a few times when there's a three-year-old that clearly meets criteria when they're in the office and based off of the information from daycares and what parents say and how they are at home and all that stuff. So if I have like a kid between three and five, well, maybe even three and six, I would um, definitely start with an immediate release stimulant. Um, because there are usually no extended release forms in the the low, tiny doses that we would use in smaller children. Um, so that's why I, I start off with immediate release in small children most of the time. Now you can titrate the dose. You can increase the dose every week to three weeks until the maximum dose is reached or until symptoms of the ADHD remit or until the side effects prevent further titration, whichever one of those happens first. Hopefully it's that the symptoms of ADHD remit and you don't have to go too high, but sometimes you get all the way to the max dose and symptoms are still present. And then sometimes you, you only able to increase the dose once or twice, but the side effects are so bad that you can't go higher. Now, there are also non-stimulant medications to use with ADHD to treat ADHD, and those medicines are um, guanfacine, their alpha agonists, guanfacine and clonidine. Guanfacine has an extended release version, which is known as Intuniv, and then there's a immediate release version, which is known as Tenex. And then there's clonidine, which has extended release Capfe, and then the immediate release is just clonidine. Now, regarding clinical pearls related to these non-stimulants, the alpha agonists, they are not as good for ADHD alone, but they work well in combinations with stimulants. They are effective for mostly impulsivity and hyperactivity symptoms, uh, sleep disturbances, so insomnia, modulating mood level and aggression, and uh, it's good for using, using it for um, ticks that may have worsened from starting stimulants. The downside to using these non-stimulants is that you may not see effects for four to six weeks, and then you have to taper them off slowly to avoid rebound hypertension. So those are the negative side of using the alpha agonist. Um, and then the side effects of the alpha agonist include sedation, headache, and sleep disturbances, even though we use it to treat sleep disturbances in ADHD, there can be some paradoxical sleep disturbance um, disturb disturbances seen with the alpha agonist. Now, there are um, other non-stimulants. So adamoxetine or Stratera is a noradrenergic reuptake inhibitor. Um, with the clinical pearls regarding Stratera, you start at 0 0.5 mil milligrams per kilogram for a week and then double the dose. If there is no effect on the full dose after three weeks, change to another medicine. 
Um, this should be considered in anyone who has comorbid anxiety or substance use disorders or tics. So someone that you may not want to use a stimulant in because um, stimulants can worsen anxiety. Um, those with substance use disorders, you, you run the risk of them abusing the stimulants. And then with the tics, if stimulants worsen their tics, then you might want to try Stratera. Um, the side effect, most common side effects with Stratera include headache, stomach ache, and then there's the black box warning for suicidality. Um, basically, Stratera works more so on the inattentive symptoms compared to the alpha agonist working more so on the um, hyperactivity or impulsive symptoms. And then another non-stimulant is Wellbutrin, um, nor which is a norepinephrine bupropion, norepinephrine dopamine reuptake inhibitor. This is a third line option for a non-stimulant. Um, and the clinical pro with this is you should consider it for children and adolescents with comorbid depression because you can basically kill two birds with one stone, treat their um, inattention from their ADHD and treat their depression with Wellbutrin, especially if they have not tolerated the stimulants or Tratera or guanfacine or clonidine. And there's one more non-stimulant that I'm going to talk about when we get to this other slide in just a second, Quelbury. I'm sure you all have probably heard about it um, and seen a lot of the um, commercials and maybe even had some um, drug reps bring things around regarding Quelbury. And I'll talk about the little bit that I know about Quelbury in a few slides. Now, the other clinical pearls um, that I want to talk about is that if a patient with ADHD has a robust response to their pharmacologic treatment and they have normal functioning, then pharmacologic treatment alone is sufficient for those patients. Like ADHD, straight up ADHD with nothing else, no other comorbid conditions is one of the only times that I do not recommend that my patients still engage in therapy. If they are treated with their stimulants and they're doing well and everything's good you don't have to to continue with with therapy you can just do pharmacologic treatment by itself so that's one good thing about adhd um, if a patient has a less than optimal response to medication has a comorbid disorder or has stressors in the family life psychosocial treatment so therapy with medication is often beneficial so you need you need both medicine and therapy in those situations, which is most situations of kids with ADHD is hardly we hardly ever have kids that don't at least have stressors in their family life, um, even if they don't have comorbid mental disorders. Um, the treatment of ADHD should continue as long as the symptoms remain present and cause impairment. However, most patients will stop the stimulants on their own at some point during the course of treatment just because, you know, as kids as kids get to be teenagers, they get to a point where they're like, I want to see if I can do it by myself. And so they end up stopping it and seeing how things go. Sometimes it goes well for them. Sometimes it does not. And they need to get back on their medicine. Um, you know, it just kind of depends. Um, but you should tell patients that they should continue the medicines as long as the symptoms remain present and cause impairment. Now, this is the ADHD medication um, guide that I recommend everyone have at least safe on your desktop, on your computer. Um, you can go to the website www.adhdmedicationguide.com and they um, revise the ADHD medication guide uh, every so often with new medicines or whatnot. So this one that's on their website currently right now was revised January 1st of 2022. So it's the most updated version right now, but it gives you all of the different ADHD medicines under the different formulations, whether it's long acting, whether it's short acting, whether it's delayed onset, um, and it's the one side, this side we're looking at is the methylphenidate side. And then this side of the medication guide um, has the amphetamine formulation, long acting and short acting. And then they also have the non-stimulants on here. And um, this one, again, being that it's updated January 1st, 2022, they have updated this one with Quelbury on there. Um, I have no personal experience with Quelbury. Uh, I'm, I have not needed to 
prescribe it at this point. Um, but the FDA approved Quelbri for the treatment of ADHD in April of 2021. It is a selective norepinephrine re-up in intake reuptake inhibitor for the treatment of ADHD in pediatric patients aged 6 to 17 years old. Um, like I said, I have no personal experience with it. I have heard from a few psychiatrists that have tried it. Um, it's still mixed on, you know, how well it's tolerated. Some folks say the patient liked it. Some folks say they've seen patients have a lot of side effects from it. So it's still, the jury is still out on Quelbri, but it is an option if someone wants to utilize something that is a, that is a non-stimulant medication to treat ADHD. So here are my resources for today's um, presentation. And um, we'll share a bit about the Child Psychiatry Access Network, and you all can ask questions. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. That's great. So we do have um, a question for doc from Dr. Morgan in here. So let's go ahead and answer that real quick um, and see what other questions we have that come from our attendees. And then I will touch on CPAN at the end. So are you able to see Dr. Morgan's question, Dr. Johnson? If I not, I will read it. I am. Okay, now. great. I am now. Um, so Dr. Morgan, um, what age do I generally see patients stopping? It's usually around the high school years um, is when they want to try it without meds. Um, they usually just stop on their own. I know your question says as they approach 16 to 18, do you have a specific strategy for helping them taper, taper or stop their meds? They usually stop them on their own and they come to the next appointment and say that they've stopped the medicine. So it's usually too late at that point. I try to tell them at every appointment, please do not stop your medicines without talking with me first, but they never listen. Um, they just do what they want to do and the parents allow them to do what they want to do, unfortunately. Um, but I explained to, to the patients and the parents when I start treatment that there's a third of folks who you treat for ADHD that will need medication lifelong. There's a third of them that need about you know, just need behavioral interventions that can manage things with behavioral stuff. And then there's a third of folks that don't require treatment into adulthood. I, we don't know which third patients will fall into until, you know, they give it a try and stop their meds whenever they decide to stop them. Um, and so that is, that is, um, basically how I discuss that. But like I said, most of the time they don't listen when I say, hey, let's talk before you stop. They usually just stop them anyway. And to be honest, you can just stop the ADHD. Like you don't have to taper them. They can just stop them. That's that's not harmful. Um, because if you think about, um, sometimes we do like what we call drug holidays in kids who are on stimulants. And so sometimes the stimulants cause so much, you know, um, decreased appetite that on the weekends or on holidays or when they're not in school, the pa the the patients take a break from taking their ADHD meds and that's okay to, to stop it in those settings. So it's not a problem to just stop the meds if they want to stop them indefinitely, you know, hoping that they can. But, um, but yes, you know, it does make it a little bit more difficult for them when they're an adult trying to get back on stimulants if they do end up stopping their stimulants. So I tell them to not stop without talking to me. And um, just also, I'm noticing in the chat, Laura, that you said that the ADHD medication guide is about $15 a piece. That's if you want the printed out laminated version that they can make and ship to you. But if you want just to have it on your desktop, on your computer, it's free to download that. That is a great point. I hadn't thought about uh, that. Uh, one of the things that CPAN has provided to what we call our super users, and those are the users that um, have utilized our services quite a bit, um, we have provided the hard copy. Um, but good point about the, the download being free. Yeah, I you have know, it on one my of the, computer, and I pull it up all the time when patients are in my office. So is that something that you would consider maybe a, a best practice, Dr. Johnson, when you're starting new pro, uh, new patients on that and you have the the, pro, the parents there with you is to, to bring something like that up and, and show them what the medication really looks like? 
not necessarily. Most of the time when I'm pulling it up when they're in the office, it's for my purposes of either remembering the dosing strategy on some of them because some of them have weird dosing. They're not, mm. not all of them have 5, 10, 15, 20 um, dosing, or it's for me to pull up and ask them if they say that they've been tried on so many different stimulants. And I'm like, okay, point to the ones that you've been on before. That's the only time mm. that I really show them. I don't show them otherwise. Usually it's just for me to utilize to remember what the dose, what the different doses are. Okay, great. Um, any other questions? Ah, we do have another question from Dr. Morgan. So, Dr. Morgan, your question is, do, you, do I have favorite behavioral tips, handouts for kids and parents with ADHD? I don't specifically have any handouts. Um, my the, the main behavioral tips that I give are, you know, things that they can, patients and parents can do to help um, improve the um, the functioning of the kid. So, like I said, when I gave the example of the parent who wants to give multi-step instructions to to a kid when they when they have you know at five that's not developmentally okay when you got a kid who's got ADHD that's also developmentally not okay not okay so I tell parents you got to break up these steps and don't um you got to break up these steps and don't um give multi-step instructions to a kid with ADHD because they are going to begin one of those steps. Give one instruction at a time, then let them complete that task and come back to you. Um, the other thing that I tell them as well is as far as like, you know, organizing and things like that is, you know, having calendars that, you know, everyone in the house is able to see or at least the kid is able to see on a regular basis so they know what's coming up when and, and being able to stay and remain on task um, and and um, not get into um, trouble for not remembering things because they, you know, struggle with organizational skills. Another question in the chat. Yes, so um, the question is, any cardiac considerations with any medications? Yes, especially the stimulants. You have to worry about cardiac history with those. And if someone has, for me, if someone has a history of cardiac issues um, or a family history of severe cardiac issues, I am going to request clearance from a cardiologist before I start a stimulant um, specifically. Um, I mean, I guess you could say there may be some issues with that when you deal with the um, alpha agonists as well, since those can have effects on blood pressure. But mostly the main considerations and the main ones you worry about are for the stimulants. But if there's no family history and no personal history of any cardiac issues, then you don't need to get that clearance. All right. Any other questions? All right, I do have a question. When I am out visiting with providers, you know, there is some concern and hesitancy I, I hear about prescribing um, medication, I think primarily stimulants um, for for younger children. And, and we heard you talk today about, you know, sometimes as early as three, though it's not real common that but there are some children that it's pretty evident that it is an ADHD situation. Um, what do you recommend for those providers who are, are hesitant either to do, uh, that they can prescribe that medication, they have the licensing to prescribe that medication, and then what do you recommend for providers who do not have the licensing to prescribe a stimulant? Um, who? I guess what who would not have a license to prescribe a stimulant? Nur, uh, nurse practitioners. Um, I don't know if physicians assistants do not, but nurse practitioners um, do not have uh, do not typically have that licensing to be able to prescribe a stimulant. And if there's okay, an MP on that. here, yeah, if there's a nurse practitioner on here that would like to add more to that, that would be you know I would I would welcome that. 
but anyway, I, I um, we do have a large, yeah, we do have a large population of nurse practitioners um, that are that are part of our CPAN program and, and large population of nurse practitioners that serve in primary care, both as PNPs and FNPs. And so that is definitely a challenge. So in that situation, what would you recommend? Um, so I don't typically, even if I have a three-year-old or four-year-old, five-year-old in my office with ADHD whose meeting criteria and is very clear, I don't typically start immediately with a stimulant anyway. I try to utilize, if I have to medicate, I'm trying to utilize one of the alpha agonists. So I'm going to utilize uh, guanfacine or clonidine first. Um, but some cases, some cases it's so severe. Like I had a kid in my office where he was basically about to be Spider-Man climbing up the walls. And it was just so blatantly obvious that it was like, yeah, there's no point in us even starting with an alpha agonist because that's not going to do nothing. We got to we got to do what is first line and start with a stimulant um, And those kids. Like I said, it, it just it had to be done. Like he he was literally climbing the walls in my office. Um, and I have a high tolerance for hyperactive kids and kids moving around and kids being kids and playing and stuff. So I, that doesn't bother me. But the kid was like, literally, I mean. He did not sit down. He was on uh, next one minute. He was in my lap. Then he was up uh, next, almost on the walls. And he was messing with the blinds. He was messing with the light switches. He was on the floor, rolling around. He was trying to get out the door and run away. I mean, he was just everything under my desk, behind me, trying to get my my chair to turn because he saw that it could move from side to side. He was just everywhere. And I told the parents, they they were telling me, you know, they can't even go to a restaurant and eat because he does not sit still. At home, he's literally, he can't even sit still for 20 seconds to play with a toy. He's got to constantly move around. Like, that's clear that this is a kid with ADHD, even though he's three years old. And I hate to put him on stimulus, but I mean, they couldn't even go out to eat as a family. So the, um, the, the kids... Um, the, the child and the parents, like when we talked about it, they was like, I told them we could try the non-stimulant, see how things go, but that the best option is, you know, the stimulants. And they was like, no, let's go with the stimulants because our quality of life is just horrible right now. Like we literally cannot do anything. We can't take him anywhere because he cannot be still. So that's what we did. Um, but yes, typically I start with guanfacine or clonidine first in the kid that young. Thank so you. it just depends on the there level a, of symptoms and how much impairment it is. There is another question here um, from Dr. Davis. Um, for kids who are homeschooled, how do you recommend uh, administering the Vanderbilt since their parents are their teachers? Yes, homeschooling makes it very difficult to adequately get that um, to multiple settings, two or more settings for um, Vanderbilt sc skills. So hopefully the kid is getting social interactions by doing other activities. And so I would just tell the parents to utilize the person with doing other activities. But if they don't even do other activities, that's that's a red flag in and of itself. And I'm just very reluctant to, to diagnose ADHD if I cannot prove that, that these things happen in multiple settings. But Hopefully, you know, they may have somebody from a church group or something that can give some information or feedback as into how the patient is um, in somewhere outside of the home. But if it's if they are just straight up homeschooled, it makes it very, very hard. And it, it, it's going to take a lot of questions and, you know, kind of teasing things out to adequately diagnose when you don't have multiple settings to compare it to, because that's one of the criteria is that these symptoms occur in multiple settings. So if you don't have that, it makes it very hard to to give the diagnosis of ADHD. Thanks, Dr. Johnson. Other questions? Something I want to mention again is that we will be starting up ECHO again this fall. Um, if you're not familiar with ECHO, um, we have had both a fall of last year and a spring of this year ECHO, uh, Echo series, um, CPAN child and child uh, 
mental health diagnoses. Um, I'm just going to pull that back up one more time so you can see that. And if you're interested, you can um, complete. I'm, I'm trying to walk and chew gum here, and I don't do that very well. You can complete the uh, the application um, to join that. There is no fee involved in this. However, there is a maximum number of attendees who can join. So um, want to make sure that you have that opportunity. I'm pulling that slide up right now. All right. Um, so it will be starting on the 16th of September. It will be Fridays at 1215. Um, our echo sessions are listed there on the screen. Um, they, the dates are not there because it could be that they um, are changed in order a little bit. That is going to be decided by our state um, CPAN group. But those will be the sessions that are being presented again. It will be every ever, every other Friday starting the 19th of September, 1215 to 115. We do understand sometimes that you have to leave a little early. Uh, we do start at 1215 because morning clinic is pretty common to be a run over. So we hope that you would join us for ECHO. Um, if you're not familiar with ECHO, either send me an email or give me a call um, or give us a call on our toll-free number. We'll tell you all about ECHO. It is a participatory um, type of learning. Uh, we do discuss cases, though those are de-identified. Uh, and it's a great way of learning and it's being used internationally. A great way of learning um, from experts and from your peers. So we'll talk about cases that you may have had, uh, discuss some best uh, some best practices, talk about treatment options, and um, expect that you'll have a, a great time. And yes, we do eat lunch uh, when we're we're doing these uh, echo sessions, and um, we also do have our cameras on. So um, we hope you'll join us, uh, Dr. Johnson. Anything else you want to add as uh, a last? Um, Last thought here for providers that may be still a little uncomfortable in treating ADHD. No, I feel like we've touched on everything. All right, I appreciate it. We thank you all for joining us today for our session on uh, clinical pearls in primary care, treating ADHD in children and adolescents. We look forward to seeing you at our next session, which will be held um, in September and will be on this uh, on sleep disturbances. So have yourself a great day. And um, if you're not part of uh, CPAN, we'd love to serve you. Thanks. Bye now.